Thanks very much, Claire. Uh, it's a really nice um, thing to, to ponder on since we talk about change so much and, uh, and automation so much. So it was nice, nice to remember about the, the human side of things. So I'll start with you and ask, um, are you seeing evidence that companies are taking on this challenge of adding value to the way people respond to change through automation? Are there success stories out there? Is it a high uh, kind of priority for companies to do this? Um, you know, increasingly I'm getting asked to speak and connect around, uh, around change and particularly mental resilience. I think that's the biggest area that a lot of companies are really taking incredibly seriously, largely due to the amount of, um, if you look at the stats around the sort of legal suits, around uh, the impact of kind of change fatigue on our, on our minds particularly, we're seeing that. Um, to be honest, I think it's when things are falling over that we're really called in versus proactive strategies for change, proactive strategies to support human beings through change. I would say the major project we're working on at the moment for, um, I don't know if I can say the WPP group, obviously a very large um, uh, group, that, that has been sponsor-led from the, the top. The change and well-being is a core pillar because they're recognising that people are leaving the industry in droves. They've got to do something about it. People are burning out. So again, it's a little reactionary versus kind of the proactive field that a lot of other businesses, you know, are already kind of convinced and converted and, and their, their spending investment in people is, is pretty high. But I would say on a whole, and the majority of our work is with agencies at the moment. It's, it's in the space of slightly reacting to all of the challenges, but they're committed. You know, we're running a three-year program to really support people to not just be surviving, but thriving in the pace of change. Thanks very much. Sophie, from the world of Dense New Aegis Network, um, uh, how, uh, I mean, you're the head of convergence and operations. That sounds like at least two jobs, like Cam, you've got more than one happening. Um, how, what, what's um, what's uh, happening in your world and how important is automation? How well is Dentsu Aegis Network managing all this change? Automation is really crucial for our success because um, we've got huge amounts of data coming at us and information and we've heard that this morning is that there's enormous amount of noise and if we don't actually automate uh, and digitise our businesses, it is quite difficult to, to navigate through and be successful. So we're, we're investing heavily in technology solutions that are going to create automation and digitisation in the, in the areas of the business that hasn't been focused for um, our media partners specifically because everyone is investing um, heavily in, in transforming their businesses and transformation programs, whoever's involved in this room knows that they're very expensive um, and, and so there's only so many you could um, support in a given um, year. So uh, the focus has been like uh, we've heard this morning in the area of the strategic content um, and data creation. However, where there hasn't been the speed that we require is operational. So when you've actually done your strategies and contents and so on, is that what happens to that is that you really need to invest in the operational infrastructure to make sure that the people that are actually going to execute your campaigns are very well equipped. Uh, that's where we've seen very slow. Uh, we have picked up the pace and we do have uh, platforms ready to deploy right now to help our media partners uh, automate and digitise. It's just a journey that we all have to go through collectively mm. to make sure that um, our um, workforce is thriving instead of surviving. Uh, very helpful insight. Um, where, where is the impetus coming from? Is the impetus coming from pressure on, on the business's margins? Is the impetus coming from a desire to utilise your talent, your, your brain's trust in a smarter, better way? Is it all these things? I believe it's actually coming from um, technologies being available today that we didn't have available to us before. It's as simple as that. We did not have technology platforms, technology solutions that helped us automate and digitize our uh, operational um, infrastructure. So it's available today and we need to be able to embrace it and, and, and jump in and deploy it 
um, so we can free up our resources to, to spend time in the high-value high areas versus, you know, the media inventory transactional space uh, with, let's say, print media. It's still very uh, bogged down by paperwork, inefficient, um, and on top of it, we've got, you know, outdated audience measurement systems, not just in print, in, in general, in traditional media. And we've heard this morning no one wants to really talk about traditional versus digital. I don't either. And I've been thinking about, you know, and that's why I've got the title of Convergence. We need to come up. We need to convert and we need to have a united and unified way of putting communication out there. Uh, and I thought that, you know, when four years ago I've established Convergence and Operations Unit, I would have achieved it by now. However, I just feel that the market is just never ready. Um, and we're running out of time, in my view, uh, and we really need to um, pick up our pace. I'm going to come back to this topic a little later, but I want to bring Cam into the discussion. Programmatic seems to me to be the most pure play, automational, transformational thing because my impression of it, perhaps a bit Luddite, is that it doesn't involve people. So I'm going to ask, you know, it's clearly transformed the way that digital media is bought and sold. Has it all been good news and, and has it created jobs or removed them? So I, I was going to comment on um, on Sophie's remark and, and I think some, some of my thinking about the impact of programmatic uh, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that because I, I think the industry is at risk of adopting technology for the sake of technology. Um, I've, I've been in a pretty privileged position for the last six years. I've, I've really led News's business response to programmatic technology. Um, and it's not been easy. And I think there's two big ideas that I'd really ask, you know, the industry and, and everyone at large to, to kind of reflect on. I think the, the first is that competing in an automated marketplace is really hard. You know, and, and, and so if you touched on some of that in terms of the, the technology investment, but you know, there's three big steps that, that news has taken uh, to be able to compete in that marketplace properly. Um, first and foremost, we in, invested significantly in pricing, inventory, and yield capabilities. Um, and you know, three years ago, I doubled the headcount in, in those disciplines. Uh, and I figured that if the um, marketplace was going to be driven through millions of pricing decisions every hour, then I wanted the best pricing and programmatic teams uh, in market to be able to, to, to respond to that threat. Uh, and I'm incredibly proud of what they've been able to achieve. The secret source behind programmatic is consumer data. And that was the second investment that we made. And we've spent a lot of time building out you know, an extensive range of attributes around our consumers. We've got over 6,000. Um, and we're not going to have the perfect data that some of the, the global tech titans have. Uh, I think there's an unfair competitive advantage that they've been able to achieve uh, through vertically integrated businesses, but we'll save my thoughts on that for another day. Um, and, and I think you know, the, the, the consumer data business for us has been incredibly important because um, it's helped us have um, you know, audience-based conversations with marketers at scale. You know, the third investment we've made quite significantly has been in our salespeople. You know, programmatic is a difficult to uh, appreciate language. It's, you know, driven with technology. It's, you know, sometimes I think it's intentionally confusing. Um, but I think the big, the big challenge for us has been how do I empower, you know, one of the largest media sales forces in the country to be able to go and have a programmatic conversation with their clients, with their agencies. Uh, and we've spent a lot of time uh, training them and, and, and building that capability. I think the, the other big idea here is, you know, and I'll, I'll borrow from a catchphrase from, from advertising from the 80s, is where's the beef? Programmatic, um, and I think marketers and media owners alike are really questioning the value of it at the moment. They've got to question the value exchange. So I'd, I'd, I, I think that, that my views on this are where's the beef? What is the value exchange uh, that is being transferred? And I think it kind of it goes back to Sophie's question principally, which is, who benefits from this technology adoption? You know, let's look at the numbers. $300 million is spent according to SMI and exchanges. It is the second largest digital media channel. Yet at the same time, uh, marketer and media owner value has been halved. Working media for $100 of media spend is half as effective in terms of its return to publishers as it was through the old model. 
So I'm, I'm very comfortable with the idea that we adopt technology and that we use technology to, to, to you know, uh, improve new systems and to, to remove ineffective ways of working. But to be honest, you know, we've got to really question the value here. Um, it's the Mark Pritchard effect. Like, you know, it, it is not right for marketers. They're actively questioning what they're getting out of these platforms. I'd like to respond to that. Yes, Sophie. <laughs> Sophie would like to respond to that. Isn't that excellent? Um, How fluid. The reason why I'd like to respond to that is that in, in, in the world I sit in is, is that is just in the digital space. And I really appreciate what you've um, done in that space. However, for me, programmatic is really just one equation of what we have to deal with. So when I talk about automation, I'm absolutely not talking about digital because that actually has too, many, too much technology already in it and uh, the technology will keep evolving. We've got now AI, blockchain and other technologies that we don't know of today, we will know of tomorrow um, to embrace in that space and I really appreciate the challenges. However, where we've been left behind is the traditional media. How do you buy print, radio, television uh, media inventory transactions. It, it, that's, that's the area where we're lacking automation and progress. So it can actually come up and compete with the digital inventory. We've heard it this morning that there is a challenge around that. As much as you can bring in an ROI, so if you're having the conversations and it's only at the strategy level, it's just when it comes down to operational and you haven't automated it, so people are not doing it via paperwork and, and various efficiencies is it's never going to be able to compete with digital. And so I'm actually really looking at it holistically. And programmatics, um, not even a decade old. It's a business model that's evolving, and it will keep evolving. Um, and you know, there's a good and bad about it, but it's an evolving business model. Let's look at out of home, right? Out of home has had uh, digitization, the out of home category according to SMI is up 19, 20%. Uh, yet there is a great mischief which is being perpetrated by some of those operators in that market because digital um, screens now means that a buyer receives at, at, a, at a minimum one sixth the share of voice that they did through an old screen. So. You, you can see again, and I'm going to sound like a real Luddite here, I promise I, I have worked in digital for the last 10 years, but you know, the, the, the reality is that uh, marketer value is significantly eroded when these sorts of technologies aren't, you know, uh, you know, aren't properly vetted. You know? a, a marketer receives one-sixth the value that they do in out-of-home on a digital screen as they do out of a normal screen. It just it doesn't make sense. I agree with you. That whole area has to evolve and it will have to mature. However, everyone's trying uh, different ways of approaching it at the moment. However, again, that's for me, it's not really part of automation. There are areas of the business that's just been neglected and not being automated. I can't imagine uh, a media buyer in the country accepting that a full page ad in print, uh, one sixth the size of uh, another would warrant the same price. And yet that, that is the mischief that the out-of-home industry has been able to perpetrate on buyers. Uh, and you know, honestly, media agencies are kind of complicit in that, given the, the transfer of media investment that's taken place uh, towards the out-of-home category. You know, digital uh, innovation and, and automation has not uh, benefited the marketer in that instance. It has is really focused fundamentally on media owners in that category, um, you know, benefiting from that. Uh, it is not a market of value, and I think we've, 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 we've got to adopt this technology and use this technology where it works, when it works for the customer. Exactly, so that's why we just need to make sure that we are looking after our resources in all areas of the businesses and making sure that they're given an opportunity to modernise the way they work. So, you know, really what I'm making a reference to is that we've got people still today filling in Excel spreadsheets and sending emails to, to book print inventory and that's just not acceptable in 2018. So we need to modernize. So I'm really taking it to absolutely basic uh, technology solutions we need to provide people so we can give them an, an opportunity to upskill and, and 
be involved in the areas where you need them to be involved and to understand the channel mix better, to, to evaluate the noise that's around them. However, like we've uh, heard it all day today, is that everyone's bogged down with so much information and they need to be able to sift through it and to just get to what's real and what's not real. And that's what we're really working with. Okay. Um, well, I guess that, that's really the making, making the point around us activating our thinking in this, because obviously with a lot of automation, it's all about efficiency and we can press the yeah. button and and things could go, but still as human beings, we've got to engage our thinking brain, right? We've got to fire that up yes. and question, ah, oh, that does not actually make sense. How do we challenge that? How do we raise the standard within our yes. agencies and with our clients to kind of challenge the thinking? So yes. I'm loving this debate because ultimately that's, <coughs> That's no, we've what got we've got to be better than than we have been before, you know, in in this space because there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of distraction, yeah. a lot of yeah. things happening. Strongly, yeah. strongly agree. I think the the, the news media industry has been char characterised, and and we saw it on the panel earlier just now. Some great discussion from some of the journalists, um, you know, and the role of news media in 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 automation has has never been more um, pertinent and more important. Um, you know, reputable websites. Uh, you know, editorially controlled environments. Um, you know, the question I would ask for marketers to ask, um, you know, is what value am I getting from the adoption of this technology? Does it mean that my effective share of voice has been divided by six? Does it mean that my buying power for digital media is halved? My working media is halved? And if they are the outcomes that this technology delivers, then I think we need to cast a critical eye over it and ask the question, Who's winning? Mm. Who's, who wins at the benefit of this technology? Who wins at the end of the game? Well, that's why I guess blockchain is going to be quite an amazing technology to, to, to clarify and bring in transparency in certain areas. So that's why it's be interesting to hear this afternoon uh, on blockchain and, and how that's going to bring in another level of complexity to digital media inventory buying. I'm sure everyone's interested in looking forward to hearing about the blockchain. Is it, is it, are these new technologies, I was going to get to the question of, you know, I, I want to kind of double back on, on um, you know, we're, we're, in, we're in a sector which competes with other, other grown up media, to use Vanessa's term, which I like. Um, and we also compete against the, the, the fangs, the news, the, the, the platforms and so on. Um, who's doing a good job in making life easy for in both those sectors, who's doing a good job in making uh, transactional, the, the operational business of executing plans well? Is anyone that sort of shot forward? Have, have we got a an opportunity to kind of round the band ahead of them? Come on, Soph. I believe, like I said, there is a, a lot of investment going on in transforming other areas of the business, and I very much appreciate that that, that needs to take priority. I mean, it takes priority uh, across all businesses um, and where it brings in revenue. However, what we have acknowledged uh, in the last um, two, three years that um, not acknowledging the operational element, once the strategies are actually coming down, once the deals are done, is that how are we going to make sure that the operational, the transactional part. I mean, just think about banks now. You can all get your phones and just do your transactions. I mean, we just need to make sure that we make it easier for our operational teams to get through through the transactional part of it, which is which is really it, the deals are already been made, the the campaign uh, decisions are already made. So if we just make that transactional part uh, easier, um, then we could deploy our resources and upskill them and and get them to focus on the areas of analytics. Like there is uh, areas that are expanding within the business. We've heard as well. You know, we all have challenges in terms of. Uh, um, revenues and, and where you're going to get more resources. Um, so you need to upskill your current um, workforce and just give them those opportunities of becoming you know, business analysts to become media analysts instead of actually just being um, processing clocks of bookings which is what the issue you've got at your end and our end at the moment. Um, that's a resource heavy area where you could automate and it is not going to have any impact on your CPMs or, or audiences. It's really, truly, it's just transaction 
I booked a half a page with you instead of actually having a conversation on the phone, I send you a piece of paper, I'm just pushing it through a technology platform, you're pushing it back to me, and in actual fact, it brings in control from both of our companies that we just don't enjoy today. Mm. And uh, uh, is there, and if there's some questions, I'm keen to, keen to get one. Um, so, if, uh, Catherine, if we could get a microphone over here down in, in the distance. I see a hand up. That's excellent. Um, uh, I've, I was having a chat, fireside chat out in the, in the coffee area there, and I, I heard that uh, Facebook's very good at, uh, at supporting uh, this, this aspect of, you know, the developed good systems. Is that because they're a young company? No. And so they're late I to the game, or...? I didn't want to actually bring in Google and Facebook because um, uh, they're unique. Uh, We're what all I mean ups. by unique, <laughs> I know, it's just that Google and Facebook provide a platform. So you could, anyone with a credit card that wants to advertise can just go in onto Google and Facebook and buy media inventory. They made it that easy. Um, however, that's we understand that's just not the norm and we've heard this morning as well that you know really those companies are, are, are seen in a different light to our media local established media companies mm. and that's really what we're saying is that we want to work with our partners our local um, media owners um, and that's that's when you we've been trading for years and just bring in an element of just you know what can technology make better for us now from just basic automation, um, nothing to do with it skewing digitally or anything like that, just basic automation. If I'm buying with the radio networks, 30, um, you know, your normal is 30 spots, 30 seconds, is at the moment you're still sending them as a spreadsheet. Uh, and in 2018, if we want to keep competing with the Googles and uh, Facebooks and Amazons coming to the market, is we just need to make sure that we um, do our housekeeping in those areas. I see. Have you got the mic there? Mr. I certainly have. Um, Sophie, what's your measure for success in terms of all this automation? Is it more things pushed through? Is it retention of people? Is it, um, you know, better... Uh, health and wellness, how do you measure the success? We have measured, um, we're, we're already um, have projects are, are um, going live. Our measure of success is that um, how much of our current resources time we are going to free that they could actually get on and do jobs they want to do. We have degree, um, you know, we've got graduates with degrees in our workforce, and they get very frustrated that we're asking them to do manual work when it comes to traditional media. They're actually looking at us for us to automate and digitize that space so they can free up their time and do the, the more interesting work. So it's what data is coming in and what insights I can get to the client, what better plans, what better um, campaigns I, I can spend my time in. So the reality is that millennials don't want to spend, I mean, they're used to their phone, they're used to being able to go on apps and do all, everything they need to do. And so when they're coming to a workforce in media, I mean, the first thing I hear is that I thought media was fun. And that is really not a good place for all of us to be, yeah? I mean, they thought media was fun and that's why they went and did a degree in it and that's why they joined us. So we really need to make sure. And when they're saying fun, they're not saying, oh, we just want to, you know, get up and dance and we want the ping pong tables or so on. They're just saying, why is there so much paperwork? Why isn't the business digitized? The reality is that we can uh, automate uh, and digitize our business. However, without our media partners, uh, there's only to a limit you can go, and it just becomes paperwork again. But what is the number? Is retention increasing or whatever? That's our hope. So, like I said, we've got a couple of programs that are going to go live, so we're seeing the change and the benefits we need to be seeing in 2019. However, if our media partners don't take it up, it's, it's, uh, we will not get the benefits that we have planned for. Vanessa. Thank you. So, Vanessa from Newsworks. I find this really interesting because in the UK, we've built those platforms. It, it exists. So, we have a platform that is integrated into all of the agency buying systems and back into the um, stakeholder systems as well. And one of the 
And all of the conversations that we had around it at the time were very similar to the ones you'll say now. It's about transforming things. It's about freeing up time for people to do the smart work and the work that they really want to do. And one of the things that we're struggling with is getting the people in the agencies to change their habits because they like the old, much though everyone talks about not liking the old way of working, that's what they're sticking with. They're still making the phone calls and they're still sending the emails. Mm -hmm. So I was, Sophie and I think also for you, Claire, what, what's your advice on how you change those habits? Yeah, I can definitely, because um, we're seeing this, because people like to sit back in their comfort zone where we're in the context Absolutely. of a really fear-based you know, environment, like the reality is, and we were talking about this, there is a, and I think Tom was talking about, there is quite a lot of fear going on because of those stats banded around, you know, 50% of roles will be obsolete by 2030, whatever you um, talk to, there is a certain amount of comfort in staying in the existing behavior. So how we really support people to fire up, trying new ways to fire up, actually it being okay to fail, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of art in itself. We really, you know, we've got to, we've got to create the environment as leaders to have people be supported to, to try different things because we've got default neural pathways about the way we do things, right? We've got these kind of default pathways and when under pressure, we react and we do it in the same way we've already, always done it versus carving out a new way of thinking. Whenever we've adopted a new habit, we've carved out a new way of thinking. So I actually believe we, we need some significant investment to support people uh, in that space to, to kind of help them. So, uh, you know, we're seeing it a lot, obviously, in the leadership coaching space, this regular conversation happening, frustration happening. Why aren't my people changing? You know, it comes up a lot. But what can we do, actually, to support them to create a culture that it's OK to step out of your comfort zone and try these new things? That would be my perspective. Yeah, and Go. hiring change managers. So, so as a business, we're actually changing because what we find is that we, we can't drive um, change ourselves. So we, we might be, we'll put the infrastructure, we get the leaders. However, in, in recent times, what we found has been amazing help for us to actually have change managers within our business, facilitating those conversations and, and, and appeasing the fear. Um, because it is not, people are, are concerned. Uh, and just depends again, which side of the age groups you fall in terms of the fear um, and the trust. That's the interesting, what we find is, is the more senior people are less fearful and the younger people are the more fearful they are. Wow, that's amazing. And what's happened is, is so we took the challenge from the agency community to build systems for them. Hmm. And now the challenge is, is that they're not using them. Well, they are, but not as well as they should be. So it's, it's easy to pick up the, the challenge, but be mindful that people are using it properly, I would say. Mm. I, I, if yeah. I can, I can build on that because I had this very same conversation with the biggest, um, one of the biggest media agencies at their conference two weeks ago. Um, and, and the issue that we've got is a, is a generation growing up in a really externalized way, obviously constantly on their phones and looking externally for feedback and reassurance. And so this really breeds this sensation that they're very underconfident, that have their internal confidence. And so I was asked to speak specifically on the fact, how do we start with our young people then feeling comfortable having the conversations to say, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure how to do it and to actually ask their um, kind of managers because we're finding that it's just a overwhelming kind of silence and, and kind of not acting. Um, and so, and I have huge empathy for that because I, you know, we're, we've got generations that are working on technical tech platforms. You don't really have to have verbal conversations or physical conversations anymore. So we're getting really out of practice with actually saying, well, what does this mean for me? Manager, okay, I'm going to show my fear that I might not know it all and obviously we've got generations coming up where they're probably expected to know it all again because they're externalized in their feedback and that they, they want to portray a picture that, you know, I've got this. Um, so again, we've got this really interesting kind of time where um, we need to build a range of skills, um, you know, so that, that would be my perspective. Uh, we're running out of time. Cam, have you got some closing remarks? I mean, I think we've, we've covered some very interesting territory here where technology and automation is being applied in different, at different times and different places to the different media. What observations would you like to, to close us out with? Um, to borrow a laboured observation from our former Prime Minister, I don't think there's been a, a better time to be alive. Um, yeah. The media <laughs> industry is dynamic. I think there's a diversity of opinion. Um, I think we, we need to, to get a new deal and news media specifically uh, you know, is on the precipice of getting that new deal. 
Um, we, as a medium and as a channel, I think we've been overlooked uh, over the course of the last five years. And I think by combining it with automation opportunities that uh, Sophie's going to help us implement, um, and you know, a, you know, a, a, you know, a reinvigorated sense of uh, purpose and confidence, uh, I feel like the next five years will, will be a lot more confident than the, than the last. Fantastic. So, if you'd like to close it out, anything to tell us? Um, what I'd really like to say is, uh, which we overlook, is that how um, fortunate we are that we belong in such a dynamic media industry. Um, we are part of the community's culture, daily conversations. Uh, yes, we are dealing with emerging um, technologies. We, uh, we are adapting, adopting um, new practices. Uh, however, at the end of the day, we are not neglecting the human element. Um, and we just need to keep reinforcing that uh, humans are the genius here. We are the ones who uh, have created the technologies and the algorithms to make our lives better at work and to be able to get through the amount of um, information data coming our way. So we really just need to keep remembering and reminding ourselves that, that we are in power not technologies, and I think that's how we can manage some of the fear that we're all hearing about. Mm. Thanks very much. Uh, can I ask you everyone to thank Claire again from Clarity, Cam King from News and the IV, and Savvy Fletcher from Dental Agents Network. Thank you. And I think that's a, that's a wrap, isn't it? <laughs>